No. <laughs> okay, good morning. Um, I'm super excited to be here with you, talking to you all about the truth of happiness. I've met Carla, she's in a happy t-shirt, so I'm delighted not the only one in a happy t-shirt this morning. Um, but yes, uh, I think when it comes to trying to uncover the truth about anything, our instinct is always to go straight for the answers. And I actually think when it comes to finding the real truth, it's more in the questioning. I think if we start to question things and we challenge them, then that's when we find our truth. And what I'm gonna to do today is kind of share with you my truth of happiness because it is individual for everyone. So truth number one is completely unique for every single person. Everyone in this room will have a different version of happiness. So what I'm gonna share with you this morning, some of it might resonate, other bits might not. So, you know, take what works for you and leave what doesn't. No heckling or throwing soft fruit if it's not your thing, okay? So that's my get out now. This is my version of the truth about happiness, okay? In academic circles, they call it subjective well-being. So it's a big sort of indication that it is entirely unique to each individual person. But here's the thing, we all want to be happy. We all want to be happy. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female, whether you're tall or short, young or old, rich or poor, what language you speak, what country you live in, what your background and history is, we all want to be happy. Even the most cynical amongst us long for a bit of this happiness thing. And some people call it like our, our default setting or this sort of ultimate currency that we need to be operating in. If you to ask parents, what is the one thing that they want for their children? They will always say, for them to be happy. So we want happiness for ourselves, but we also want happiness for other people. Yet why is it so hard to find it? Why is it when, when we live in this world of abundance, when we can have anything and everything, happiness seems like it's in short supply. Now, Aristotle says that there's two different types of happiness. One is all about the experiences of pleasure and enjoyment, and the other is more for experiences of meaning and purpose. And I want to kind of explore both of them with you this morning, because I think that sort of using both of them, it will help us find the truth about happiness. But I think there's a bit of an issue because this was written by the academics at University College London. And I'm sure you'll get from me standing up here for the last couple of minutes, I'm not an academic. I'm definitely not. I don't have a clue what that says. I can read that it says happiness, I've got that, but other than that, I haven't got a clue what's being said. But I think that's part of the problem because in terms of my truth about happiness, I think we're overcomplicating it. My version of happiness doesn't need a fancy equation because happiness isn't actually a thing. It's not something that you can pick up. You can't squeeze its cheeks, you can't give it a cuddle, you can't carry it around with you wherever you go. Happiness is an emotion, it's a feeling. So essentially, we're always one thought away from happiness. Yet why does it always seem so hard? It seems so elusive, it's, it's out there somewhere. One day we'll discover it. it's hiding. Why can't we find it? So I think for me, sort of truth number two essentially is, I think we're overcomplicating it. I think happiness is actually a lot more simpler. My version is anyway, I'm a simple person, so you'll, you'll soon realize that if you haven't already. But the reason I think we overcomplicate it is all linked to this idea. At Art of Brill, we talk about this a lot when we work with children, when we work with adults, the message is still the same. We put happiness off. We think it's at the other end of the rainbow. It's this emotional pot of gold that we will get there one day. If we work really hard, we will succeed and then we will be happy. We've grown up being told this. We know, we think it's over there. It's external to us. But what if it's not? What if we've been taught wrong? What if happiness is this amazing feeling, but it might not be over there? Maybe we're sort of looking in the wrong place a little bit. Perhaps we've been missold happiness. And this idea of sort of destination addiction, I'm sure you can all resonate with. We've all been guilty of saying, I'll be happy if. I'll be happy when. You know, when I get this promotion, when I get this job, when I get this new car, then I'll be happy. 
but then it comes and we get habituated to it. We suddenly are like, oh, okay, well, this is my new normal, so I'm fine. So then it's on to the next thing. And every time we seem to be getting closer to that far end of the rainbow, well, it seems to be moving further away. So I think this is kind of part of the problem that we're looking for it perhaps in the wrong place. In philosophy, they teach us that happiness is now, this moment right here, this is happiness. But the trouble is when we apply this sort of thinking, well, there's always a better now. We're always waiting for a better version of now to come along. You know, oh, yeah, sure, I want to be happy now. I get that Buddha, but actually I'm busy trying to get to happiness over here. This is where it is. This is what I've been taught. This is what I'm going to do. But the trouble is when we get to that future moment, that version of us that we think will be happier, well, it goes because it's also made up of the present moment. Every moment we go through is now, but we miss it because we're too busy trying to get to over there. Now, somewhere along the lines, we, we grew up thinking that Mondays are bad and Fridays are good. And this sign, to me, tells me if I can survive the week, then I'll be happy. And we, so thinking of this destination addiction, thinking of happiness over there, what we're doing is telling ourselves, if I can just get through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, here comes Friday, I'm going to be happy now. On the radio, and I mean this, this is the truth, I heard them say that they're calling them terrible Tuesdays. So Mondays are bad, Tuesdays are terrible. We know when we get to Wednesday, which is hump day, it's all downhill until the weekend, and then we're happy. And what we're doing is we're kind of living life in this daily blur. So we're sort of telling ourselves, if I can just survive today, then I'll get to the next day, and then I'm a day closer to being happy. And what we're doing is we're sort of just skimming the surface. We're not allowing ourselves to slow down and notice what's going on in each day. Instead of surviving each day, we should be thriving in each day. We've been taught that Mondays are bad and Fridays are good because we've learnt from what everyone else is doing. We learnt when we were little from the big people that that's what you do. Happiness is then. But when I work with children in primary schools and I go and sort of put this sign up and I say to them, what's your favourite day? They look at you gone out like you're crazy because they haven't yet learned. They haven't put their happiness off to five o'clock on a Friday with a glass of something in their hands, thankfully. <laughs> now, not wanting to push you too far, but at Art of Brill, we sort of try to get you to flip your thinking a little bit more. Because essentially it's this, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday are all worth a seventh. Each of them are worth a seventh of your life. So if we write off Mondays, that's a seventh of our lives we're just wiping out. And if we put all our attention into being happy on a Friday, then what we're saying is we come alive for a seventh of our lives. We are not here for long enough to be playing at our best one day a week or at the weekend and writing off every other day. So let's flip our thinking a little bit. Let's challenge it. What if Monday, yes, sure, it's the start of the week, but what if it's a, a new opportunity? What if everything's ahead of us on a Monday? What if it's all to play for? And what if Friday, it's all behind us? It's another week of our lives gone by. Maybe. But here, here I think is the issue. The reason that we've learned that Mondays are bad and Fridays are good is because of this. We've been trained. So we're social creatures. We need people to survive. If you ask people what is the biggest predictor for your long-term happiness, the answer is people. So we need family, friends, community, a tribe. We've evolved to fit in and do and say what everyone else is doing and saying. And that's okay so long as we're all right being like everyone else. But if we're wanting to have an amazing life and we're wanting to discover the truth about happiness, perhaps this sort of thinking isn't sort of gonna lead us down the correct route. The big people, when, when we were little, they taught us that if you work really hard and then you, you struggle, but you keep going and then you succeed, then you'll be happy. 
So we've learned to do that. And as we get older, we then start to prioritize work over, over play, you know, news instead of stories, reality over imagination. We've learned because that's how we've been taught. And we're on this sort of like this hamster wheel where we're just constantly going faster and faster. The pursuit of happiness, it's like a fast race, but it seems to be taking us even longer to get there. And I think it's kind of linked to this idea. And we need to start challenging it. We need to start thinking a little bit differently because if we want to know the, our version of happiness, if we want an amazing life, then we kind of need to sort of start to stand out for all the right reasons and do things a little bit differently to what everybody else is doing. So, this is sort of what we're told. We think you work really hard, you succeed, then you're happy. But let's be honest, this is what it's more like, okay? This is me, a mess. This is, life is messy. It always is. Nobody's like, this is social media telling us it'll be fine, you know, that snapshot. But instead it's taken hours and, you know, years of, of working really hard to get there. We, always, we only see this sort of snapshot and it's scary because when you work with young people, that is all they see. They've got that sort of tunnel vision. <gasps> this influencer, they, they've succeeded. They did it overnight, mom. They, you know, they're just doing it in the bedroom. They've sort of put up a, a screen and oh my gosh. You know, when you go into primary schools and you ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? The number one answer is to be a YouTuber. I know, someone's got their head in their hands. I'm there with you. I'm like, oh my God, you know, no, really? Is that, is that a job? You know, I thought that was like a side hustle, but no, that is an actual job. That's what people, the young people want to do because that's what they see, because that's what they've been taught. You work hard, you succeed, then you get to happy. But we all know to get to happy, it sometimes requires a bit, yes, a bit of work, but also it can be a bit messy. It really can. So I think, like I say, we need to start sort of challenging that a little bit. And working with young people, I think it's really important to challenge that, challenging their thinking so that they don't grow up thinking that they've got to get onto this hamster wheel of constantly striving, working hard, succeeding, and then I get there. Okay? Happiness isn't all about the things you own. It's not about, you know, your material wealth isn't the same as your emotional wealth. So our economy is sort of founded on, on human weakness. So if you think about, you know, sports cars, gym memberships, plastic surgeons, travel agents, our sort of dissatisfaction and dislike for ourselves is what drives us to purchase things. And we tell ourselves, we buy these things, then we'll be happy. We've succeeded, so we've got to be happy. But the trouble is, the more we get, the more we want. And we're living in this society that is completely overfeeding us, but we're undernourished at the same time. So we're overstimulated, we're overconnected, yet we've never been lonelier. And that's heartbreaking, especially when you think of the young people that we have in our lives as well, that this is what they're being told. And I'd just like to share a quick story with you that I find sort of illustrates this point. Um, some of you might know it. It's um, the fisherman and the businessman story. So I'm just going to go for it in case you haven't heard it. Um, but basically, there is a wealthy businessman who's sort of on, on a beach somewhere early, let's say in Brazil. And he's sort of like looking out to sea and he's watching the sunrise come up and he sees a local fisherman sort of just rowing his boat back into shore. And he thinks, oh, it's early, I've got a little bit of time, I'm going to go over and have a chat, you know, why not? You know, it's a nice thing to do. So he does, and he, he says to the fisherman, um, what have you got? You know, he says, well, I've just caught some fish. He says, well, you know, is that enough? He goes, yeah, yeah, that's enough, because I'm going to go home and feed my family now. And the businessman sort of says, well, could you not have caught more? And the fisherman says, well, no, I've got enough, enough to feed my family. And the businessman's like, well, it's really early, what? what are you going to do with the rest of the day? And he says, well, I'm going to go home with the fish that feed my family and then I'm going to spend the time with my children and my wife and then in the evening I'm going to hang out with my friends and we'll drink and we'll dance and we'll just have a good time. And the businessman's like, whoa, 
let me tell you something. I've got a PhD in business management. This is not the way you do things. What you need to do is this. You need to stay out there longer and catch even more fish. Because if you catch even more fish, yes, you'll be able to feed your family, but you'll also be able to sell a little bit and you'll be able to make a bit of money. And when you make some more money, you might be able to buy yourself a bigger boat. And the fisherman's like, oh, okay. So then what? Well, when you buy a bigger boat, you can, you can get some other people working for you. And then if you get more people working for you, you can buy a whole fleet of boats. And he's like, okay. And then what? Well, once you get a whole fleet of boats, you'll be able to catch even more fish and then you, you're gonna need to sort of sell it. So what you're gonna need to do is move from this tiny little fishing village and go to a big city where you can distribute all the fish. Okay, and then what? Well, then you're gonna work really, really hard for many years, but then you're gonna to get to a certain point where you think, you know what, I don't really need this. So you're gonna sell your company, you're gonna retire, and then you're gonna to move to a nice quaint fishing village where you can go out <laughs> and you can fish for as much or as little as you wish and share the fish with your family and spend the day with them and drink in the evening with your friends. I don't think we need success to be happy. Success is not a requirement for happiness. Dave, um, Dave Ramsey has a really good quote where he says, we, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. Yeah, it says it all really. The thing is, it's really easy to kind of get caught up in it though, okay? So I'm not standing here in front of you and being like, you know, I don't, I don't care about these things at all. You know, I'm human. So, you know, we're all have got our little things, our little quirks. But it's really easy to kind of think a few nice holidays a year, a new, like a new car, a promotion, get all these things, then we'll be happy. We get sort of wrapped up in it. It's easy to do, okay? We're all guilty of it. And the reason for that is because it's so easy to recognize happiness in these moments. So if you think about when you're on holiday, you know, you're seeing a beautiful sunset, you've got your family with you, probably you know, pina colada or something in your hands, you're like, oh my gosh, this is happiness. It's easy to recognize happiness in that moment. But what we talk about is this idea of the beautiful ordinary or the extraordinary ordinary. So this is where you find the beauty in the everyday stuff, in the mundane moments, the everyday experiences. But we're so busy, we're so frantic, we're constantly striving for success and wanting more, but actually leaving us with less. We're just getting through the day super, super fast and not appreciating all the beauty that is around us every single day. And I'm sure you'll, you'll understand this, when it came to sort of lockdown a few years ago, for the first time in my life, I enjoyed a walk. I used to see it as like, oh, something you've got to do, you know, but I actually enjoyed a walk. And I was able to enjoy a walk because I noticed things. I noticed the daffodils coming up. I noticed the blue sky, I noticed the clouds, I noticed the sun. And notice the farmer's fields. But they were always there. But I was just too fast. I was like, oh, I haven't got time for this. I've got to march on. I've got to get on. I've got so much I need to do. And sort of lockdown sort of forced me like it did for everyone else to sort of slow down. And that's when I finally got this, this idea of finding the beauty in the most ordinary moments. So slowing down and appreciating this awe and wonder kind of moments. So we don't need to go to Greece to take a picture of an amazing sunset, because guess what? The sun still sets in your back garden. So you can still take a picture and do it and see it there, or don't, better yet, don't even take a picture, just capture it with your eyes. Be there in the moment instead of behind a screen or thinking happiness is over there, a flight away in Greece, something like that. We're so guilty of chasing after the extraordinary that we miss the ordinary. And when it comes to happiness, I, I think it's the little things that add up to become the big stuff. So it's the stuff that you do every day is what counts more than the things you do every once in a while. Now, I've sort of mentioned a lot about this idea of sort of pleasure and enjoyment, that first type of happiness that Aristotle referred to. I want to just sort of look at the second type. And the second type I said was this experience of meaning and purpose in your life. So happiness isn't about never having a problem. It's not about struggling, you know, never struggling. Happiness is about having to live with all of these emotions. No emotion is bad. 
But the trouble is, when we sort of seek out the meaning, the, the pleasure and the enjoyment side of it, what do we do when times get really hard? Because we're all have been through or will go through tough times. There will be dark days. Happiness is a bit in short supply in those moments. You know, we're not going to really find pleasure and enjoyment when we are really struggling. So what do we do? How do we get out of bed in the morning? How do we put one foot in front of the other? How do we keep showing up? And that's where I think this second type of happiness comes in, meaning and purpose. Because meaning and purpose, it does something to you that the other version of happiness doesn't. It stops you focusing on the external. It stops you looking out there for the answers. It allows you to come back to you, the internal. So instead of thinking about all the things that you cannot control and getting really wound up and really upset about, meaning and purpose allows you to slow down and start looking at actually what you can control. And what we can control are our thoughts, our behaviors, our attention, our attitude. And all of a sudden, there's a lot more things that we can control in a situation that we never thought we could. They sort of provide a spark when life gets a bit messy. They give us this sort of drive to survive when times are really hard. They give us hope. And hope is something that will keep us going. Hope is something that in those dark days will get us out of bed in the morning and keep showing up despite the world trying to sort of beat us down. So something that we do in our workshops with, um, with children and adults is this idea of gratitude. And gratitude is a wonderful way of sort of flipping our thinking. It's almost like we sort of need to restore the hardware in our brains and go back to sort of factory settings. It's like we've got to relearn how to be happy, relearn how we do things, how we think about things. And gratitude is a great way of doing that. Because most people go most of their lives thinking of all the things they haven't got. Remember what I said, I'll be happy if, I'll be happy when. You know, I haven't got that, so I can't possibly be happy. So-and-so's got a bigger car than me. So-and-so's got a better house than me. We're comparing ourselves, and as a result, we're feeling rubbish about it. And we're complaining about all the things that we're missing. But gratitude does something different. Gratitude allows us to start looking at all the things we actually have got. And when you sort of get rid of all the noise and the chaos and you sort of slow down enough to notice, we already have so much. We're so incredibly lucky. I mean, you're sitting on seats, you know, it's a nice warm room. You know, we're not sat sort of outside. You know, there's refreshments, there was cake, you know. We've got, we're doing pretty good for a Friday. Some people haven't had any of those things. When we work with children in schools, I sort of say to the, them, say, okay, put your hand up if you woke up in a bed this morning. And then they sort of, they will, and they sort of laugh about it. I say, okay, put your hands up if when you went to the bathroom this morning to brush your teeth and you turn on the tap, water came out. Well, yeah, obviously. Okay, what about that water that you look at? Was it clean? Could you have drank from it? Well, yeah, obviously. What about who's come to school this morning in a car? Well, yeah, obviously. And they, all, they take it for granted. But when I say to them, okay, great, I'm delighted to hear that. Because truthfully, there are so many children around the world that haven't had access to any of those things. And you can suddenly see them, oh, really? They suddenly start to take notice. And that's what gratitude does. It suddenly opens our eyes up to all the good that is actually in the world instead of focusing on all the bad. And we're so guilty of looking at the bad stuff. We have this negativity bias where we, we've evolved to look for the bad. So our brain scans the environment five times a second looking for danger. Our brain's number one job is to keep you safe. So obviously, if you hear a loud noise coming from over there, you will instinctively turn around and be like, <gasps> ready to go that way. Because it's in us, we're hardwired to think like that. But gratitude challenges that. It gets you to try to sort of rewire your thinking, stop looking for all the bad and start focusing on the good. We are living in the safest time in human history. Yet we've never been more stressed, 
or depressed or worried about things. What gratitude does, it brings out positive emotions and it brings us back to the present moment. I think happiness is very much anchored in the present moment. And if you are sort of experiencing negativity or negative emotions, it's because you're not in the present moment. You'll be thinking about the past. You'll be thinking about the future. And that sort of opens you up to sort of suffering. With the exception of pain, nobody suffers in the present moment. Good things happen in the present moment, but we're missing it because we're looking over there. We're thinking happiness is over there. If we succeed, if we work really hard, then we'll get to happy. But actually, we're at our happiest when we're paying attention to what we're doing, when we're in the now. Every moment, I said this already, but our, every moment in our lives is made up of now. We can't let them pass us by because it, by letting all these moments pass us by, ultimately that's life passing us by. So by being present in the moment, it allows positive emotions to, to flood in and it allows you to start feeling a bit better about the world, but also about yourself and about finding your version, your truth of happiness. Now, if I was to ask everyone in this room or everyone in this building, what is true happiness for you? It, don't worry, you don't have to answer it. But the thing is, you'll all come up with loads of different answers because that's fine, because I said at the start, happiness is individual. But the top answer would be roughly along the idea of contentment, well-being, a sense of joy and purpose and contentment. That is really the top answer. For most people, that is where it is. So it's this idea of knowing you've got enough. There's a saying that says, when you're content, you're rich. So you're essentially, you've got everything you need. And if we can try and sort of start being a little bit more content in the present moment we're in, I really do think we will discover the truth of happiness along the way. So I just want to share another story with you before I wrap up. And uh, again, I'm sorry if you've heard it before, but it's a story about two of my favorite authors. So Joseph Heller, who wrote Catch-22, and Kurt Vonnegut, who wrote uh, Slaughterhouse Five. And there was this story that um, Kurt Vonnegut shared with the New York Times after Joseph Heller's death. And it, I remember hearing it on a, a podcast a few years ago, and it just sort of stop me in my tracks. You know, like those moments when something really just like resonates with you and I was like, oh my gosh. So now that I've talked it up a little bit, I'm going to tell you the story. Uh, hopefully it lands. Um, but what happens is they, both the authors are at this party of a New York billionaire and Kurt Vonnegut's kind of teasing his friend, Joseph Helen. He's like, you know, Joseph, how do you feel about the fact that the host of this party has earned more yesterday than all the royalties of Catch-22 will ever make its an entire history? And Joseph Heller's like, I'm okay with that because I have something that he will never have. And Kurt Vonnegut's like, what on earth could that be? And Joseph Heller says, the knowledge that I have enough. And I just think that is so powerful. He's not chasing. He's happy with where he's at. He's content. In Sweden, they have this word called legom, which is essentially not too much, not too little, just right, like Goldilocks kind of a thing. It's just right. This idea of enoughness. And the Swedes believe that if you can sort of focus in on legom, having enough, being content with the present moment, content with what you've got, then you get a bit of balance in your life. Things start to slow down and you realize that you're far luckier than you ever imagined and you have everything you need. And then it sort of takes this pressure that we put on ourselves and the external world puts on us and allows us to sort of find a bit of peace and ultimately find a bit of contentment. So back to the rainbow. Some questions to sort of think about then. I, what if happiness isn't over there? What if happiness isn't external? What if when you achieve something, you don't get teleported to this magical land of happiness? What if we've been looking for happiness in the wrong place? 
because I think happiness is here. It's at this end of the rainbow. Happiness is something that's always been here and it always will be here, but we've just been too busy to notice. Happiness has sort of been hiding in plain sight, right under our noses, but we've been too busy looking ahead, trying to succeed and strive and outdo each other to get to happiness, because that's how we've been taught. But what if we question that? What if we've been missold happiness? Actually, if happiness is right here, right now, then that really does take a lot of pressure off. And thinking like that has absolutely changed my life because I used to be so hung up in the past thinking, oh, I should have done this. I wish I'd done this better. And then, oh my gosh, living in the future, I was just constantly thinking of what was next, what I had to do. Once I do this, then I'll be okay. You know, once I've gone for this run, then I'll be great. You know, it'll be fine after that. And I was constantly going through my day thinking like that. And what I didn't realize was that it wasn't just one day. It was a week, it was a month, it was a year, and all of a sudden it was my life. I wasn't actually living in reality. When we're thinking about the past and the future, we are living in, in our heads. So actually, bringing it back to this end of the rainbow, what if happiness is right here, right now, and we've just been missing it? Thank you very much. Thank you.